opportunity for Asia to answer any questions regarding what it's like to be a student in our program. Um, I'd like to also reiterate that if during this program, anything we, we uh, mention, if you have a question about it, please jot it down in the question and answer uh, box. Uh, we may answer it during the session. And at the very end, we have uh, a session after we have um, Asia talk about what it's like to be a student here. We'll have um, an opportunity for you to ask anybody in this panel questions, whether it's me as the program director, uh, Nick as the director of clinical Aid education, one of our representatives in admissions, or our assistant uh, associate dean, Jessica. So I'd like to start with a, a short video uh, from our association, from our respiratory um, association, American Association of Respiratory Care. They just put this one out. Um, so it's just going to be a second for me to pull it up. Just to get everyone excited about the field of respiratory. I'm a respiratory therapist. I am a respiratory therapist. I'm a respiratory therapist and I save lives. A respiratory therapist is a professional who has been trained to work with patients who are affected with chronic lung disease across the spectrum. So anything that affects your breathing, a respiratory therapist is likely going to be involved in the care of that patient. A respiratory therapist is not only a therapist, but a practitioner. We help patients in so many different capacities, not only with breathing, but with education, with lifestyle. So we have many different roles throughout healthcare. It can involve working in a hospital such as the ICU, in the neonatal ICU. We can work in the emergency department. We can work in diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, we do outpatient education. Um, we do smoking cessation, asthma education. We work in pediatrics. So, you know, a respiratory therapist, we hold so many different roles that really helps the community in so many different ways. I'm a respiratory therapist. I'm a respiratory therapist, and I care for my patients breath by breath. The thing I like most about it is, is the variety of the day and the variety of the career. In the hospital, my mind, we have neonates all the way up to adults. Uh, we have a burn ICU, trauma ICU, so we can be anywhere at any time of the day. There is always a patient that needs uh, something unique. Sometimes there are physicians that have uh, different needs that we have to take care of. The it starts off finding out where I'm at, where I'm assigned to, uh, getting a report uh, from the night shift, seeing what the plan is for the patients, and then um, you know, going to see every patient, doing rounds. I work in pediatrics, so I may get five patients, may get six patients, but they're patients that need help with breathing. And my job is to provide them with their treatments. A typical day would be going from giving a treatment to maybe a five or six year old that's slightly sick, then going into an intensive care unit, somebody that's much more ill in every decision that I make on how to set that life support machine could affect their outcome. We have so many different pieces of equipment and they all do so many different things from a wide variety of life support equipment to staining equipment to equipment that just will deliver oxygen. So a typical day is just checking equipment, meeting with our our people. Or, um, we also will go in-house and check on the therapist in-house and see if they need anything. But primarily we're waiting for calls and they come we usually do two to four transports a night. And they can be anywhere from two or three hours long to six hours long or sometimes even beyond this year. We see each patient anywhere from one time a day to six times a day, you know, depending on the type of patient. The day will typically end around about five, six o'clock in the evening, so about 12 hour days. I'm a respiratory therapist. I'm a respiratory therapist, and I love taking care of people. I worked in a teaching hospital, so it was routine that we always had students, you know, following us. Precepting students was one of our responsibilities. So that's how I got into education. I became a clinical instructor. Um, that also opened another door for me um, when a program director position became available. Empowering 
the patient to manage their chronic lung disease so that they understand that they can live a good life. It's about quality of life. So I feel that if I can help teach them on how to handle their chronic lung disease, it's about having the confidence that they're going to be okay. The education and dealing with the patients, it's very satisfying to me. Uh, you're going around with someone you haven't seen in a while, but they look at you, the family looks at you, they remember you and they're happy to see you. That just that makes my day. It makes it all worth it. I'm a respiratory therapist. I'm a respiratory therapist. I'm a respiratory therapist, and I make a difference. Hold on one second. All right, so that was just um, on their American Association of Respiratory Care website. They have a, a number of different videos that they just put out talking about a lot of different things in our field. Um, I, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a link. It, it's a great uh, resource if you are not sure if you want to become a res if you want to go into respiratory to see more about the field. So I'm going to move on and talk now about our program. Um, we have the only fully accredited, accredited, we have the only accredited respiratory care entry level baccalaureate program in New England. Um, so we're proud of that. A lot of a lot of different hospitals in New England want to have graduates that are, have baccalaureate degrees. So that is a great thing. Thank you. Um, our program provides eligibility for state licensing, licensure and um, credentialing through the National Board of Respiratory Care. So once students graduate from the program, they're eligible to take the National Board exam. And once they pass their National Board exam, then they can get state licensure in whatever state in the United States that they were working in. Um, we have faculty that is that are experienced in acute care. Um, so the faculty is both Nick, myself, and we have a part-time faculty. So we have all been, we're all experienced in intensive and emergency medicine. Um, a couple of us are, are um, have had a lot of experience in pediatric and neonatal. Oh, and I should say one of us, um, our part-time therapist has flown on LifeStar. Um, we have a lot of experience in pulmonary function testing and pulmonary rehabilitation. Nick still works in a hospital, so it's great. He, um, he's been working this past weekend. He worked at, um, at, at Waterbury Hospital, so it's really wonderful. He's up to date on everything that's going on, especially now with COVID-19. He has the latest information um, that he shares with uh, our program. In the classroom, we try to do innovative instruction. We use different technologies like real life case studies. It's really important to get students started right away on different case studies so they can understand what it's gonna be like. We typically do collaborative group sessions, a lot of times flip lectures, especially now with a lot of the online learning, uh, but we'll do lectures where we record and then we practice in the classroom setting. Um, we use, uh, the black, well, all of the University of Hartford uses the Blackboard course management system, which is fantastic. Uh, we can post um, presentations on there. We can do all the assignments. We can have our syllabus for our clinical classes. We put there uh, all the contact information for the different hospitals and any particular instructions for each hospital. We put our, their schedule so they know exactly where they're going each clinical day. Um, also with the Blackboard, they can uh, look at their grades at any time. Uh, it's a great course management system. Uh, we tip, we tend to use some response systems in our in our classes, like clickers or poll everywhere, to help make sure that um, the students are engaged and that we know where they are. You know, sometimes I'll just ask a question. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Or I just may ask a question. If I know that hardly anyone got it right, I might go back and review something. So it allows us as instructors to to get a sense of where everyone is, but it also keeps the students engaged. Um, we're really proud of our simulation lab. So our kind of our model of teaching in our program is we teach it in the, in the classroom. We practice it in the classroom lab. So we have lots of gadgets in the field of respiratory. We'll, we'll, we take them out. We have a big lab that has a lot of equipment. We take them out and we practice. And then we, we go into our simulation lab um, and practice everything as well. And then we go do it in the clinical. So at this point, I'm going to um, have um, Nick Galliasatos talk a little bit about the simulation lab. I'm going to go to the next slide. Go ahead, Nick. 
say anything. Um, I do want to apologize. Oh, thank you for that. I do want to apologize if you hear anything overhead. I am at the hospital at the moment. So if you hear any uh, emergencies uh, over the intercom, I do apologize about that. Um, with that being said, um, as uh, Professor Griffiths just mentioned, before students go into clinical, they have to be able to demonstrate uh, to us, to the faculty, that they are competent in managing a lot of the uh, equipment that we use in clinical. So it's a clinical based program. So there's a lot of emphasis on students completing competencies. So step one or part one to these competencies that the students are gonna go into the simulation lab and perform their competencies. So I'm gonna give you an example of what it's like for a student to perform one of these competencies in the lab. Uh, so for example, uh, a student uh, is given a scenario or a clinical case that you see uh, on your monitor at the moment. Uh, so for example, uh, we'll uh, 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 the student will see that there's a 58 year old male who's found unresponsive at home, uh, difficulty breathing, and there's an empty mo uh, bottle of pain medication, which is uh, known to suppress their breathing or slow down their breathing. So the student reads their clinical case, and from that point on, we head over into the actual simulation. So, um, and then the students given uh, when 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 they begin their simulation, they have the patient's vital signs. Uh, so you can see on the on the uh, PowerPoint that their heart rate is very fast. Their breathing has slowed down. They're having oxygenation issues. Uh, they're given some more additional information. But essentially, they gather all their clinical information and the clinical, the lab competency begins. So we're going to show you an example of what it's like for a student to participate in the lab competency. Thank 
Again, that we're going to enter to here. And in the same, so you're the is stable. Uh, while we're in fact, on AD, I can't remember what the next time. We're going to do a good job simulation of level. Okay, I'm going to close that out. Go ahead, Nick. So, you know, the the biggest one of the biggest benefits with doing these competencies for the students. Well, there's a couple different uh, uh, reasons. Uh, number one is to build up their confidence as they go into the hospital, especially into the intensive care unit. But the second uh, very big benefit of having these simulations is that we have the opportunity to debrief with the students. So in some ways, um, we do hope that the students do make a mistake uh, because we want them to make the mistake during the simulation. Um, and then after the simulation, we can sit down with the students, watch the video and discuss um, what they could have done uh, better or what they could have done for a better patient outcome. So there's a lot of benefits to doing this uh, simulation labs uh, really builds up the student's confidence before they go into the clinical and it um, gives us a time to de debrief with the student and review um, anything that uh, they might have missed. Uh, so that was one example of how we prepare our students um, for clinical. Uh, in addition to what you saw, in addition to the um, lab, uh, in addition to the lab uh, simulation, we, we also run software for the students. We also run uh, software uh, for the students. They're able to practice using mechanical ventilators. And this is actually a little sneak peek because our students haven't seen the software yet. Um, this is software that we use now since our students are not in clinical due to the pandemic. Um, so I'm going to quickly show you how the software works and how the students are able to uh, manage mechanical ventilators. So you've probably seen mechanical ventilators um, on the news that um, during the pandemic. So I'm going to, if you give me two seconds, I'm going to run the software and kind of explain how this works. Okay. So again, what you're seeing here is the interface of a mechanical ventilator. And the students have access to their monitors, to their screens, and they're able to gather up a lot of data from a mechanical ventilator. They're able to see their graphics. They're able to see exactly how the patient is breathing. So they study the graphics. They're able to troubleshoot. Uh, they're able to see if there's any abnormalities. Uh, once they finish uh, observing the graphics, they are given the physiological screen and they're able to obtain a lot of the patient's vital signs. Um, so in, as they're looking at their uh, vital signs, we're hoping that they notice uh, in this particular example, um, we hope that they notice that the patient's heart rate is very high, the saturations are very low and they're having difficulty breathing. So they gather as much information as possible. Uh, they start to think about what it is that they're seeing and try to figure out what the problem may be. Now, once they gather their information, um, the students are then given a small narrative and an actual clinical scenario to tie everything in. So if you give me one second, I will show you an example of that.
So this is a short little narrative that the students uh, read. They get additional clinical information. And from this point on, after they kind of digest all of this information, they're asked multiple questions to determine the appropriate um, action to take for this particular patient. So when they're done reading this narrative, And then uh, they're given multiple examples and they can pick between A, B, C, and D. Um, well, there's only one correct answer here. Um, and once they pick whichever choice that they want to pick, um, on their end, on their tablets um, or on their home screen at home, when they pick the letter A, for example, um, that information is automatically uploaded to the ventilator. So they can see instantly if they made the uh, right choice, if they made the wrong choice, if they made a choice that could harm the patient. Um, everything is uh, synchronized, so they're able to see instantly um, the effects of the choice uh, that they made. In addition to being able to do these simulations, students also have the ability to practice interpreting chest x-rays, so we have chest x-rays that the students are able to study um, and as they would in clinical as well. And lastly, uh, the software uh, gives students the ability to take a look at different EKG strips. Um, so especially we have a lot of therapists that work in the intensive care unit in the ICU and you know the fundamentals um, Part of the job description is to make sure that you're able to interpret uh, EKGs. So you have to know the basics. You have to know really how to interpret these EKGs for emergency situations. So this is uh, exciting new software that we recently purchased. Our students haven't even seen the software yet. So we're going to roll this out uh, this summer. And I think the students are going to be very excited because it's very interactive. It allows students to prepare for clinical. Uh, it allows students to um, just really get their confidence up um, for clinical. So I think uh, the students are gonna be excited to use the software. So, I think that is it for the VentiSim software and Karen um, from this point. So I'm just going to share my PowerPoint that I had originally and we're going to move on. Thank you. Um, that was a great demonstration. So again, it enforces how we practice. We talk about the, uh, the material in the classroom. We practice it either in the lab that we have in the classroom or the simulation lab. And now we have this new software that if the, when the students are on campus, they each get a tablet and they can do all these immediate changes and see the results right there in the in our labs to allow, like, like Nick said, to allow the confidence to improve and their skills to improve before they're going into the clinical setting. And we'll talk a little bit about the clinicals in a few slides from now. But the last part of the education, of course, is going into the different hospitals and treating patients in a clinical setting. All right, so I want to spend a few minutes before we talk about our clinical education to talk about the curriculum. Um, and usually it's very interactive. I can ask you, you can ask me questions as we're going. So this is a little different for me. What I, I hope you will do is keep writing questions in the question and answer. So if I'm ask, saying something about the different years or the curriculum, different years of the curriculum, and you think of questions, please write that down so you don't forget your questions. Uh, we, we have a really small group, so I'm hoping at the end it's pretty interactive. But our first year is uh, we're not we're not in respiratory courses the first year uh, that you're at the University of Hartford. It's general education courses, core math and science courses. We're doing introduction to health professions. Uh, we do though have some sessions where we get all of our our first year respiratory therapy students together. We talk a little bit about uh, we do do an orientation both in the fall semester and the spring semester 
about what to expect about the program. And we also invite the students to um, join the respiratory care club that we have on campus. And Asia will be talking when she does the uh, student panel. Uh, she is a great person to talk about with that respiratory care club because she is the president of, president of the University of Hartford Respiratory Care Club. So we do try to get the students involved in respiratory. We get them excited. Asia started a mentoring program. So students who are in there, it, either in the prerequisite, we call this the prerequisite year, or earlier on can pair up with somebody who is more advanced in the program. So she did a great job doing that. Uh, the years two to four, that's when they start the professional component. That's when they're into the respiratory uh, courses. So during this time, they're gonna take respiratory classes in the classroom. Uh, starting sophomore year, they'll be doing a lab the fall that we, it's a three hour lab where it matches up with one of the classes where we talk about a lot of different equipment and theories in respiratory, and they're gonna practice it all in the lab and the simulation center that we have. And, and we have um, a simulation room that's just a couple of rooms down from our regular classroom. And while it's for all of ENHP, primarily respiratory therapy, the respiratory therapy program uses it um, primarily, I should say. So we use that quite a bit for our um, clinicals that first year. We're in the simulation room probably 50% of the time or more. Um, and if we're not in the simulation room, we're in the laboratory. Uh, so during that, that year, you're going to be doing uh, additional science courses some all university curriculum, which you probably, you may have heard in different sessions, but the university offers courses that are kind of general courses that everybody takes. So it's an opportunity to be in class with maybe somebody who's not a respiratory major that, that you're friends with. Um, and then also electives uh, will be during those years two to four. Some sample respiratory classes you're gonna be taking during that time, and this is not a inclusive list, but respiratory diagnostics. We might teach you how uh, how to take a, how to draw a, arterial blood gases, how to interpret arterial blood gases, we teach all about oxygenation, um, different oxygenation equations to know how well someone's doing if they're, they're having difficulty in that manner. We have cardiopulmonary anatomy and physiology. We teach two mechanical ventilation classes. Uh, we teach a disease management class, pediatrics and neonatal class, pulmonary, rehabil rehabil pulmonary rehabilitation, as well as pharmacology. So this is a typical respiratory student week. Um, this is really a junior, the junior year. So junior year, you're gonna have classes Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, some students will choose to only have classes Monday and Wednesdays, and then they have Fridays off. Um, and then they'll have clinical Tuesdays and Thursdays. The Tuesday, Thursday cl clinical during junior year, both uh, fall semester rather and spring semester is all day. Seven to 3.30 is a typical clinical shift. And the classes, again, will be on the alternate days. Um, sophomore, freshman year, there is no clinical. Um, so sophomore year, the first semester, the fall semester, there's a lab on campus on Fridays. And on, in the spring semester, that's when we start going out to the clinical sites on Friday, just on Fridays. Um, and so the classes, the regular classes, will be Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So at this point, I'm going to let Nick, um, Nick's going to talk a little bit about the respiratory care clinical experience. So I'll give you a overview of our the way the clinicals are designed. <clears throat> so if we the, our clinicals are spread out over four semesters in general. Uh, so we have the first two clinicals that are general uh, respiratory therapy clinicals. And then the last two clinicals are designed for the intensive care unit and ICU. So during these clinical rotations, we have adult uh, rotations for adult care. We have pediatric care, and then we have neonatal care. Um, and again, before students even go into the clinical, they do have to demonstrate the competencies uh, to actually go into clinical inside the lab. Um, so most of our clinical sites are within 60 minutes uh, driving range. Um, and you can see on the slide, there's some examples of the clinical sites that we use, like Hartford Hospital, Yale New Haven, Bay State Medical Center, and Connecticut uh, Children's Hospital as well. Um, 
uh, the important thing I, I just want to get across is uh, when the students go into clinical, they have their dedicated clinical instructors. So when the students start clinical, uh, the first couple of days is an orientation where they get to meet their clinical instructor, acclimate to the actual hospital. They look at the hospital's policies. Um, so the first couple of days of clinical, um, it's really an orientation. They just kind of warm up the students before they get hands-on practice with students. Prior to starting clinical, um, the students do uh, receive a background check. All of their immunizations have to be completed. We use uh, we currently use Castle Branch to keep track of all of their health forms. Um, and again, when the students are in clinical, uh, they again continue to practice their clinical competencies uh, before they finish their clinicals. Um, so again, there's a nice little progression with the clinicals. They go from general floor therapies and they kind of slowly work their way into critical care. In addition to doing these clinical rotations built into the clinical rotations, we do have specialty rotations. For example, we do have students going into cystic fibrosis centers. We have students going to pulmonary rehab. We have students doing uh, pulmonary function tests to help uh, diagnose uh, COPD or asthma, for example. Um, and they get exposure to education and during their advanced clinicals, um, as you can see, uh, there's a list of all of the additional specialties that they get, including management, education. Um, so it's a nice little progression as the students are in the program. Um, so working with the students in lab um, kind of really helps build up their confidence to um, you know, start clinical and be successful in clinical. Our, our clinical instructors, are, um, they're very um, supportive with the students. Um, they provide additional help or, you know, uh, they're always there for the students if they need anything. Um, and again, we do keep track of all the health forms through Castle Branch and we do use uh, Trajexis to keep track of all their competencies. So before the students graduate, they do have to complete a certain amount of competencies. And lastly, what I'll say is that uh, during their clinical rotations, I do come out to the clinical sites and I, we do what's called a post-conference. So I usually meet with the students um, a couple, three to four times a month. I try to go out to every site at least once a week. And at the end of their clinical day, at the end of their shift, uh, we do a little conference where we meet and the students present their patient. And we get uh, we have the opportunity to talk about their patient, talk about what they did with the patient. Um, it, I'm there to answer any questions they might have had um, relating to their patient care. So we just, again, just reinforce as much as we can from the classroom. So. It's designed, I think, in a way that it's really uh, helps students uh, to be successful in clinical. Thank you, Nick. I want to remind everyone, this is usually a time where if we are meeting face to face, I have a lot of hands go up. They want to know all about this. So if you have any questions, please put them in your que the question and answer. I don't want you to forget them by the time or jot them down somewhere. I don't want you to forget them. Um, one thing I also want to point out with the advanced clinicals is that everybody gets to do two. So each student will choose two advanced clinicals that they want to do. Um, and within reason, we try to get everyone into the ones that they would like. Um, some Usually we do them in the fourth year st uh, study. Sometimes people have an opportunity to do them during the summer between their junior and senior year. Um, and then we will look into that depending on the, the advanced clinical they want to do, there may be an opportunity to do a different time. Um, and then with the advanced clinicals, we have students going further away than the hour. We may have students going up to Boston children. We have uh, stu students going up to Boston children's as well as Brigham and women's, uh, which are great sites to do those advanced clinicals. So our program accreditation, we are an accredited program, which allows students to then sit for the board exam. Uh, the 
Respiratory Therapy Program Accreditation is called COARC, Commission on Accreditation for Respiratory Care. Uh, we have earned the maximum accreditation. Uh, so we have a currently have a 10 year accreditation that we received in 2011. And we are due for, I'm working actually on renewing our accreditation uh, for our next cycle. Um, so at the very end, I have some links. If you, there is a link for the co-arc site if you wanted to take a look at that. Our graduates, uh, we, are, we have students who uh, are very successful. Our students uh, typically earn very high rates on the national um, exams, our board exams. There are two different board exams they'll eventually take. Uh, the highest level for a respiratory therapist is to be a registered respiratory therapist in our RT. So there's two different exams to take to earn that credential. They have to take um, a first test we call they call a TMC therapist multiple choice. They have to get a high score on that. There's a threshold. So if they get the threshold for the high score, they're eligible to take a computer simulation exam. Um, and then we also uh, typically, and, and this is an example, we have a, a few this semester this year who don't graduate until September, uh, but they are already getting offers for jobs. Now they cannot work as a licensed respiratory therapist until they complete the program and until they receive their, um, they take practice their boards. But many times hospitals, especially now during the pandemic, hospitals are really looking for students to help fill in in a student role. Um, so uh, I know Asia is looking to, uh, to work, Asia currently works as a equipment, um, aid at Hartford Hospital in the respiratory department, and she may get promoted to a student role. That's something she's looking into right now. So our graduates, uh, we have graduates who have done everything. We have a lot of graduates who are practicing respiratory practitioners. Uh, we have many graduates who are managers in the state and elsewhere. We have graduates who are educators. I am in fact a graduate of University of Hartford um, respiratory program. Uh, we have graduates who are leaders in the state and national organizations. We've had uh, one of our graduates was the president of the, our national organization, the AARC. Um, and we have many other graduates who are leaders in the state as well. Um, over the past five years, over 90% of our respiratory therapists have found employment within um, 12 months of graduation. And I think that number would be even higher. Some actually move on, um, decide to go on to get a master's degree. Um, so we have uh, some who are doing that as well. So characteristics of health professionals, I'm just gonna take a look at my time. I wanna leave enough time for my, uh, the question and answers. But some um, characteristics of health professionals, they tend to, have, they, they need to have strong science and math ability. We do have, throughout the program, um, we do have uh, courses where they need to be able to do math equations. Um, for example, uh, something we, you know, we're evaluating how someone's oxygenating. There's equations like the alveolar gas equation or oxygen ratios. So they're not incredibly hard math, but the students need to at least be able to understand math. Um, they absolutely have to enjoy working with people. They need to be compassionate and emotionally mature. They have to have good oral, written, interpersonal and communication skills. They have to like a challenge and responsibility. Um, with respiratory, we're con everything is constantly changing. You have to uh, stay on your toes. It's an exciting field, uh, but you have to be willing to, uh, to take on different challenges. Uh, you have to have the ability to think and work independently, think critically and work independently. We're working many times with life and death situations, and you need to be committed to lifelong learning. So at this point, I had the RCP student panel, but we really just have uh, Asia. But this can be questions for anyone. I want to start with questions for, for Asia. So I know we're opening up everyone's microphones at this point. So hello. Anyone, uh, can anyone hear me? All right, we're starting to hear someone is. So I'm going to leave it up to, I'm going to start to get someone those questions. And if you do, you can speak now. Otherwise, I'll have some questions for Asia. All right. I'm having a little bit of feedback issue. I'm going to start off the questions. I'm going to ask Asia a question, and then if, um, I'll leave some time if you have other questions. So, Asia, I'm going to start with um, 
What have you found most surprising about your program or something that you haven't expected? Running water or doing something like that. <laughs> I'm actually wondering if we should maybe um, mute everyone just so Asia can speak and then we'll open it up again. So Asia, um, <laughs> thank you, Colette. Did we mute Asia too though? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think in general, it's been um, interesting being in the program. I feel like the entire program has been a little bit of a surprise for me. I think going into it, I wasn't really sure what to expect as far as the clinical education piece um, goes, but I think the most interesting has been just seeing, um, you know, how much we are all over the hospital. You really do get exposure to all different aspects of what it's like working in the hospital. So we've had the chance to, you know, do floor therapies. And then you progress into working in the ICUs. We've had the opportunities to work in um, children's hospitals and pediatric hospitals. So that's been really exciting to get to learn, you know, all different kinds of um, things. And I think for me, the most surprising were was um, doing the arterial blood gas that Professor Griffiths mentioned before. I didn't know that that was a function of the respiratory therapist, and that definitely has been the most surprising and interesting. Um, part, so we're, you know, drawing blood from an artery, which is really cool once you get to learn how to do it. I think that has been the most surprising and exciting piece <laughs> for me. <laughs> Asia, if you, what is one piece of advice that you would, you would give to an incoming student? Uh, my biggest piece of advice would be to um, try not to be nervous. I think it's normal to have a little, you know, bit of, um, nervousness going into it just because you don't know what to expect but i know for me personally going into it looking back i was really nervous i just didn't know what to expect and um the truth is you know you're never alone whenever you're at the hospital you have your instructors that you can always rely on and i think it's important to kind of take you know the stress off of yourself and feeling like you have to have everything figured out like you're still a student in this you know, position and it's okay to ask questions and it's okay to get help. And not only is it okay, but it's encouraged. Like your instructors want to get to know you and they want to help you. So I think um, just remembering to, you know, have fun with everything that you're learning, obviously in a safe manner, but just, you know, remembering to ask questions and just ask questions and try not to be too, too nervous. <laughs> What I would ask for our panel, our um, participants right now, if you have questions and uh, if you have questions, please put them in the question and answer and we can read them out loud to Asia. And then for the host, I can't from my screen right now, because I have my PowerPoint up, I don't see the questions. So do we have any questions right now or should I ask Asia a couple more? So Asia, um, in terms of the scrubs, uh, what do you wear when you're in clinical? So for us, we're wearing, um, a white top and navy blue pants that have, you know, the embroidery. So it says your name and the respiratory care. Um, that was also surprising and a fun piece. I know um, a lot of us are really excited when we get our scrubs. It's, it's definitely an exciting time. So, so moving forward, though, we have changed the color of the scrubs. Um, so the the incoming classes starting with our, our group, uh, our sophomore group right now, uses a red, the University of Hartford red with um, the University of Hartford logo and with steel gray pants. And those are available in the bookstore. So we have them in there reasonable. We have them available for students to get in a variety of different sizes. Um, so, uh, Asia, what is your favorite aspect of clinical work? Um, I think it would be just all the interacting that you get to do. You really get to work with so many different healthcare professionals. Um, you know, you have to interact with physicians, nurses, physical therapists. I really enjoy being able to work as part of a team with other people and deliver the best patient care we can. So for me, that's the best part. Um, like I mentioned before, the arterial blood gases are always fun. And I think it's just, you know, a little bit of the adrenaline that you get in these um, scenarios, it can be fun and it makes it exciting and 
you really just never know what to expect every day you learn something new and you're learning something new all times throughout all of the times throughout the day so it's always fun and exciting and um it's really cool to be able to you know make connections with your patients and to just be a part of the team helping is really fulfilling um i'm just asking a question I sometimes here when we are doing it face to face uh, I've heard some students want to know what your typical day is like. When you're, when you're in a clinical setting, what is a typical day? So usually you go in in the morning. Um, it's pretty easy. You want to make sure you have your coffee or your tea or whatever. Water for sure is really important. Um, always grab breakfast before. And then you kind of start off the day where you get to meet with your instructor. You're taking report from the therapist who was on before you. So they're basically giving you, you know, important details and an overall like snapshot of how the patient was before you got there. So you get to kind of get a little bit of background information to use going in. Um, and then you uh, prepare yourself. You want to get all your materials, your medications ready, and then you go into the room. You're going to do your treatments or your ventilator checks, whatever you're doing for the day. And um, we kind of have a little bit of a break time where you're um, doing rounds. So it's not really a break, but you're doing, you participate in rounds with all the healthcare professionals. And um, it's really interesting. You definitely get to learn a lot there. You're learning a lot more, even kind of out of the scope of just respiratory stuff. They go through the patient care um, plan from, you know, head to toe essentially. And you're learning a lot and you get to give your input where you can and then we'll have lunch, um, if you have time for that. And then uh, we do our second rounds where we go back and see our patients again in the afternoon. And then we will pass off report to the next therapist coming on. And it seems like a long time. I know initially when I went into clinical, I was like, oh my gosh, seven to three, like that's, that's gonna be a long time. But the day really does go by a lot faster than you expect. And you are pretty busy throughout the day. So it keeps it fun and interesting. And there really isn't, you know, much downtime. And when you do have downtime, you definitely want to be using that time to do like patient research and make sure you know all the important details about your patient and, you know, their care plan. Do you feel like you were prepared um, to go into clinical? Did you ever feel like you, you didn't get what you needed prior to, or did you feel like the, the classroom and the simulation helped you feel more comfortable in the, in the clinical setting? Yeah, I definitely felt like I was always prepared for a clinical. I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying before. I naturally was just extra nervous because I just nervous at times. So I think um, if you're being realistic, when you you definitely are prepared through what you learn in class, and if you just utilize that information and you know keep a clear head and just know um, that you are prepared. And like I said, you can always ask for help or. You know, um, if you need additional instruction, that's always available to you in clinical. But I think for sure you're prepared for what you learn in class and practicing in the sim lab has definitely helped a lot with, you know, making you more confident when you do go to clinical. So for sure, I think you get prepared from what you learn in class to be ready to go in clinical. Can you tell us what made you decide on University of Hartford? So I actually transferred to the University of Hartford. Um, I live in Hartford, so it was kind of an easy choice for me. My sister graduated from there as well, so that was part of it. But I think um, the minute for me, once I stepped foot onto campus, I just felt really inspired being there. Um, I felt like I just had the resources available to me. I think everyone that I spoke to was always super friendly and helpful. And even if it wasn't, you know, the right person that I was looking for, they were always helpful in directing me in the right direction to whatever I needed. So I really appreciated having that support. And I think um, I just felt really inspired on campus, which for me was a big deal because especially going into this kind of field, you know, you do a lot of studying and it's nice to have um, a positive and supportive environment to facilitate. And I know I, want, I, want, I know we only have a couple of minutes left, so I want to uh, just for you to say a couple of words about the Respiratory Care Club and but I also want to talk you to talk about you're really involved. So you make the most of your time at University of Hartford. I know you're not just involved in the respiratory care club, but you're involved in other things on campus as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about campus life or the respiratory care club or both? 
Yeah, so both. I think and that's another piece of advice that I would add is to definitely, definitely get involved on campus. I think it just makes the experience that much more exciting and interesting. And you really do get to meet a lot of people outside of your program. Um, and it makes it more fun. So uh, as far as the respiratory care club goes, I think that's definitely something important to be involved in. In the major, you get to meet people that are in your class and in other classes, and it's nice to just get to know people who have the same, you know, interests and um, it's definitely a good thing to have. You get to work with a lot of people and we've implemented the mentoring piece, which has been really awesome. So you'll get to, you know, meet a student that's either older or, or you know, once you are progressed into the program, you can be a mentor and it's really awesome to just share your experiences and get to know um, your fellow respiratory therapy students. Um, and there's other, you know, organizations you can get involved in. I volunteer for the American Lung Association, which has opened up a lot of doors for me and introduced me to a lot of people, you know, in our field and outside of the field as well. And it feels great to give back to the community and to just know that you're making a difference and um, yeah, definitely awesome things to add on your resume and to talk about in interviews. So I would always recommend getting involved. Um, on campus, I'm involved in Red Caps, which are the summer orientation leaders, and that has been a super exciting, life changing experience. So I definitely recommend, um, you know, joining clubs and getting involved on campus. I think it makes the experience um, a lot more worthwhile. Thank you, Asia. Um, I don't see the question and answer pa um, panel. Do we have any questions at this point? I'm going to. Okay, not right now. So I'm going to um, go to the next slide where I have just some resources. And what I should have put on here is my email. I know sometimes it's hard in this format to ask questions um, with a whole, whole lot of people here. So I'm going to just say it out loud. My email, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, it's on the University of Hartford website, but it's my last name, Griffiths, G-R-I-F-F-I-T-H-S at hartford.edu. So if you have any questions, if you want to follow up, um, I know when we do this face to face, there's usually a ton of questions. So I'm, I'm guessing that you have a few. Um, so certainly just shoot me an email. I can even set up an individual um, virtual meeting with just one on one with with you guys if you prefer that. So here are some of the resources we talked about. The first one is just a link to all the health professions at University of Hartford. And from that, you can get the, uh, the respiratory or just type in respiratory when you go to University of Hartford, hartford.edu. Uh, the next one is, uh, I think it's a pretty interesting one, Occupational Outlook Handbook. It talks about different occupations. I specifically put a link to the healthcare um, handbook. It gives you an idea of um, what the job growth is gonna be, how, what the, the average pay is. It's a good thing to, to look into whenever a job you are, you're looking at. Um, and then the AARC, that's the one I showed, the BNRT. Um, that is the American Association for Respiratory Therapists. It's a great website if you're still not sure what you want to, if you, you want to go into respiratory. It's a great website to take a look at. The MBRC is our national board for respiratory care. That's our testing agency. Um, I put that on there in case you want to take a look at that. And then the Commission for Accreditation for Respiratory Care, that's our accrediting agency. So th from there, you can look at the um, you can look at how each program did on uh, does with their exams. You know how their pass rate. You can look at a bunch of different um, thresholds that we have to report on a regular basis from um, that Commission on Accreditation for Respiratory Care. So I think we're out of time. Um, I appreciate everyone everyone coming, and I, I hope that you follow up if you have any further questions. And for the host, is that, Vicki, is there anything else you would like to add before we leave the session? Or Colette? All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. I think it was very thorough and really great. I hope everybody um, got everything they needed out of it. And I'm glad that you offered one on ones. That's awesome. Bye, guys. Um, actually, Asia just gave her, uh, can someone read, Asia gave her email too. Thank you, Asia. If, get, if anyone has a question for a student, and I don't have the screen anymore. Is it just your last name, Asia? Yep. So it's just Levitan, L-E-V-I-T-A-N at 
hartford.edu. You can just email me and ask me any questions that you might have. Thank you, Asia. No problem. Thank you. It's a great resource. So if you have a student a question about living on campus or anything about stu student related, uh, Asia is a great resource. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.